Step into the wild where hunters set out but never come back. Imagine mysterious stories unfolding in the vast, unknown landscapes. Picture dense forest becoming the backdrop to puzzling disappearances. Join us on a journey into nature's secrets, exploring eerie tales of hunters vanishing without a trace. The wild holds mysteries, and these stories dive into the chilling uncertainty when hunters become part of the enigma. Get ready for stories that leave you intrigued and questioning as we unravel the strange and unexplained events that unfold when hunters enter the wilderness, disappearing into the shadows of the unknown. Zeb Hughes, a 21-year-old student at Mississippi State from Wesson, and Gunnar Palmer, a 16-year-old from Hazelhurst, were not just avid duck hunters. They were two souls bound by a common love for the outdoors and a passion for supporting wounded warriors through their volunteer work with Jeep Sullivan's Wounded Warrior Outdoor Adventures. It was on a chilly morning, December 3, 2020, that the two friends set out on a hunting trip near the Mississippi River. The air was crisp and the promise of a wounded warrior hunt the next day fueled their excitement. Riding in their truck with a boat trailer in tow, they headed towards their usual hunting spot in Port Gibson. Gunner's dog, Ranger, was always present on Zeb and Gunner's hunting trips, but this time Gunner decided not to bring the dog for reasons unknown. It was 2 p.m. in the afternoon when Zeb and Gunner were nearing their usual hunting spot, which was Port Gibson, where they parked their truck to begin with the hunt. As they were pulling into Port Gibson, Zeb took his phone out and made a quick call to his mother, Sharon, saying that they were getting into Latorno Landing before saying goodbye, and his usual, I love you, to his mom. Zeb was a sweet child despite being 21 already, and it shows. With excitement on their faces just like the first time, Zeb and Gunner went out of the truck with rifles on their hands and carrying everything they needed for the hunt. They were pretty skilled despite being very young, and it really shows just by the way they carry themselves near the water. Even though they've experienced hunting for ducks several times now, they're still mesmerized by nature and was always excited with what they do. There, they rode on the boat trailer they always carried and started their anticipated hunt. At first, the hunt was going so well with Zeb and Gunner peacefully navigating the waters and talking about random things. But when the night came, mysteriously, they never came home. Gunner's father always calls his son whenever he knows that he's coming home from their hunt. Gunner's dog, Ranger, was also patiently waiting for his beloved owner to arrive home, but he didn't, and this concern med the most, even Zeb's parents. The news struck the hearts of their families, particularly their fathers, Med Palmer and Barry Hughes. The search efforts involved local authorities, wildlife agencies, volunteers, and even the U.S. Coast Guard spanned weeks and months. Boats scoured the river's surface, sonar delved into its depths, and aircraft and drones combed the surroundings. Yet the mighty Mississippi held on to its secrets. The fathers, Barry and Med, refused to succumb to despair. As the weeks turned into months, they embarked on a relentless quest for closure, grappling with the pain of not knowing the fate of their sons. The Mississippi River, with its vast stretches and deep currents, became both a symbol of tragedy and a source of solace. National Boat Safety Week brought attention to the importance of boater safety, echoing the pain expressed by Sharon Hughes. She advocated for caution on the waters, emphasizing the need for preparedness to avert heart-wrenching incidents like the one that befell her son and his friend. The one-year anniversary loomed, yet the fathers persisted in their search, exploring riverbanks in the hopes of finding any trace of Zeb and Gunner. The Mississippi River, once a witness to their joyous hunts, became the backdrop for a poignant quest for closure and remembrance. The story weaves through the emotional struggles of the fathers, the beauty of the river that claimed their sons, and the enduring connection between the families and the mighty Mississippi. The river, which took away two young lives, transformed into a place of reflection and remembrance for those left behind. As Med Palmer drove thousands of miles with Gunner's dog, Ranger, by his side, he reflected on the irony of finding peace in the same river that stole his son away. The river, with its calm beauty and unforgiving currents, became a canvas for the fathers to paint their memories and seek closure. Up until this day, Zeb and Gunner were never found. Jeremy Ivan Childress, or better known by family and friends as Jeremy, was a loving 31-year-old husband from Oregon to his beautiful wife Kristen and his two children, which includes a three-year-old daughter and an eight-month-old son. 
He was an avid outdoorsman and hunter, and has been frequently going out to a particular section of the Tillamook State Forest in Tillamook County to hunt and explore nature. He was often described by his family, friends, and peers as an experienced hunter, especially by his hunting partner, Shane Louie. Jeremy and Shane were often seen going to hunting trips together, particularly on that one spot in the Tillamook State Forest, where Jeremy knows every nook and cranny. The two would always come home successful and full of new experiences to cherish and share with their families and loved ones. On October 15, 2004, Jeremy and Shane planned another trip together to the same spot where they would usually hunt, the Tillamook State Forest. Grabbing their rifles and other useful items, they set out for the hunt. This time, Shane decided to bring his 12-year-old son, Shane Jr., so the child could experience what a real hunt was like and to teach him the basics of hunting. Jeremy was glad that Shane was able to bring Shane Jr. with them, as he was eager to share all his hunting prowess with his friend's son. As the three arrived at their usual spot, Jeremy and Shane began to set up a camp for them to rest and plan the rest of their hunting trip ahead. Shane Jr. eagerly watches as the two seem to be so skilled in what they do. After setting up their camp, the three decided to rest and wish the best for the next few days of their hunt. It was October 16, 2004, exactly a day after they arrived, when they decided to hunt together. Jeremy, Shane, and Shane Jr. navigated the forest smoothly, and they arrived at the usual spot where Jeremy and Shane would hunt. It was another successful hunt, and it was time for them to go back to their camp. However, there was one problem. They seemed to have lost their way back. Shane Jr. was terrified when he realized that they were lost, but Jeremy assured them that he knows the way back, and he wants to search the area himself, giving Shane and Shane Jr. a promise that he will come back with knowledge on where their camp is. And there, exactly at 4.30 p.m., was the last time that Jeremy would be seen alive. A few hours after Jeremy had set out by himself to search for the camp, Shane and Shane Jr. decided to find their way back themselves, as they thought that Jeremy had already reached it and just forgot to go back to them. However, when the father and son had successfully reached the camp and found no trace of Jeremy there, that's when they knew that something was wrong, that Jeremy was missing. October 17, 2004 marked the official declaration of Jeremy Ivan Childress as a missing person. The forest, once a haven for his adventures, now held the secret to his disappearance. An exhaustive search yielded no clues or traces of the experienced hunter, who knew every inch of the Tillamook State Forest. Eleven days turned into weeks, months, and eventually 19 long years. Jeremy's fate remained a haunting mystery with his family trapped in a perpetual state of uncertainty. As the 10th anniversary of his disappearance approached, his mother, Becky Grimes, clung to hope, haunted by the enigmatic circumstances surrounding her son's vanishing act. In the backdrop of towering trees, Becky tirelessly placed flyers, tended to a small memorial, and refused to let the case fade into obscurity. The forest, once a playground for adventure, now echoed with the unanswered questions of a grieving mother. The details of Jeremy's disappearance, etched in the missing hunter alert, spoke of a man with a love for risk-taking adventures and the outdoors. A loving father and husband, he left behind a family grappling with the void he left in their lives. The dense vegetation of the Tillamook State Forest became a canvas for unanswered questions, a labyrinth of uncertainty where an experienced hunter disappeared without a trace. Becky Grimes, with tearful eyes, spoke of her enduring hope, a beacon in the darkness, that one day the mystery would unravel and Jeremy would be found. In the dense woods near Brant Lake, New York, an ominous tale unfolded on November 15, 2015. Thomas E. Messick Sr., an 82-year-old ex-paratrooper and seasoned hunter, embarked on a routine hunting trip with friends and family. Clad in camouflage, armed with a rifle, and equipped with a walkie-talkie, Messick joined a group of seven professional and experienced hunters, just like him, for what should have been an ordinary deer drive. Despite having several health issues, such as a blind eye from a gunpowder accident and being hard of hearing, Messick was still active and eager to participate in different hunting and outdoor activities to spend the rest of his senior years filled with exciting and cherished memories. During his younger years, he has taught firearm and hunting safety, and his son also noted that despite his old age, he was still great and going around well. The plan was straightforward. Messick would serve as the watcher while the others drove deer toward him. 
The team consisted of quite old and experienced hunters, with four of them older than Messick and three younger. There, they set out on their exciting hunting journey. As they were navigating the woods, the hunters, even Messick, noticed a strange feeling in the woods. There were fewer animals than usual. Not even a single bird or a squirrel could be seen. The only sound they could hear at that time was a strange, unexplainable sound that echoed through the area all throughout their hunt. As the group reconvened at 3 p.m., a sense of bewilderment crept in. The seasoned hunter, Messick, was nowhere to be found. Despite immediate efforts, including noise-making, distress signals, and calls to forest rangers, Messick seemed to have vanished into thin air. A massive search unfolded, involving hundreds of volunteers, forest rangers, and even FBI agents. The search covered vast areas of the Lake George wild forest, but no trace of Messick, his belongings, or any wildlife emerged. The woods, once teeming with life, fell eerily silent. As investigators delved into the mystery, various theories surfaced. Could Messick have fallen into hazardous terrain, or did foul play shroud his disappearance? His age and health conditions made wandering far less likely, intensifying the mystery. Despite exhaustive efforts, the case remained open, with the FBI expressing uncertainty. Witnesses recounted peculiar events on that ill-fated day, unexplained noises and an unnatural silence in the woods. Messick's vanishing act became a chilling mystery, prompting questions about the events that transpired that November day in the Lake George Wild Forest. Was it a tragic accident, foul play, or something more mysterious? The haunting silence of the Adirondack wilderness enveloped the fate of Thomas E. Messick Sr. Diving deeper into Messick's profile added layers to the mystery. His poor hearing, limited vision, and a history of health issues contradicted the possibility of him wandering far. The distinctive details of his camouflage attire the walkie-talkie, and the rifle fueled the intrigue. His wife of over 50 years attested to his expertise as a hunter, adding a poignant touch to the puzzle. The plot thickened as connections emerged with another disappearance, Fritz Drum, a 68-year-old who went missing within 10 days of Messick. Two stories with eerie similarities unfolded in the backdrop of the Adirondack wilderness. The disappearance of elderly men seemingly unlinked yet sharing a mysterious thread added an element of the unknown. The strangeness deepened, with witnesses recalling an uncanny silence in the woods and reports of an unidentifiable noise. Was it nature's hush or a harbinger of the mysterious events that transpired that day? In the quest for answers, the narrative unfolded further with the recounting of the hunting day. Four older men stationed as watchers, the younger hunters driving deer in a peculiar silence enveloping the forest. A friend's memory echoed a strange sound, indescribable yet haunting. The pieces of the puzzle didn't quite fit, and the disappearance of Tom Messick lingered, casting a shadow over the Adirondack landscape. The search expanded with forest rangers, volunteers, and even specialized teams, but the wilderness held its secrets. The possibility of foul play lingered, drawing the attention of the FBI, injecting a federal dimension into the local mystery. The unusual involvement raised more questions than answers. Up to this day, Messick, even a single trace of his existence, was never found, and all the possibilities from being suddenly killed by someone or something, abducted or even more terrifying, such as anything supernatural, were all made more questionable with a single thing, the strange silence and the unidentifiable noise that the hunters, the searchers, and even Messick heard on that very place where he went missing. The Colorado Mountains stood in stark contrast to the familiar landscapes of Muldrow, Oklahoma, where Alvy Webb, an 86-year-old former principal and teacher, embarked on his annual elk hunting trip. It was the morning of October 19, 2019, when Alvy had set out on an exciting hunt. As the sun began to cast long shadows over the rugged terrain, Alvy set out on a solo elk hunt near the Divide Road Roaring Fork area of the San Juan National Forest. His family, well acquainted with the custom, left him alone on a familiar trail, expecting to reunite at the bottom of the hill around 10 a.m. Little did they know that this would be the last time they saw Alvy. When the hunting party returned as planned, anticipation turned to bewilderment. Alvy, with his sharp mind and love for the outdoors, was nowhere to be found. The family retraced his steps, desperate for any clue that might lead them to the missing patriarch. Yet there was no trace 
No boot print, no sign of struggle, just an eerie void where Alvy had stood hours earlier. The ordeal set off a massive search effort, drawing upon the resources of rescue teams, bloodhounds, Blackhawk helicopters, and the relentless determination of family members. The mountainous terrain, with temperatures plummeting to the teens, added urgency to the mission. Five days of relentless searching yielded no results, and the official search was reluctantly called off. Alvy's mysterious disappearance left everyone involved perplexed. How could a man of his age and familiarity with the surroundings vanish without a trace? No signs of distress, no communication from his cell phone. The void seemed to devour all leads. The family, friends, and authorities grappled with questions that echoed through the silent wilderness. Some eerie similarities emerged between Alvy Webb's vanishing act and other hunters who had disappeared under mysterious circumstances. Was it the unforgiving environment that claimed him? Or did something more sinister unfold in the shadows of the Colorado mountains? The desperation of Alvy's family was shown through news reports, interviews, and heartfelt pleas. His granddaughter, Macy Spaulding, summed it up as a nightmare, a sentiment shared by those who knew the affable hunter. The annual hunting trip had transformed into a harrowing tale, leaving everyone clinging to hope and praying for a miracle. As the events unfolded, the search for Alvy Webb continued, shrouding the Colorado wilderness in a veil of mystery. The additional information painted a portrait of a man whose sharp mind defied his age, a man who undertook the yearly hunting ritual with enthusiasm and a keen sense of direction. The extensive search efforts, both on the ground and from the air, painted a picture of frustration and disbelief. Despite thorough searches covering large areas with meticulous precision, Alvy remained elusive. The helicopter sweeps, the infrared drones piercing the night sky, and the grid-patterned ground searches all yielded no sign of the missing hunter. The perplexity deepened as details of Alvy's last known location emerged. A trail near Divide Road, a meadow where he had hunted before, and the Roaring Fork Road, all familiar landmarks, now bore the weight of an unsolved mystery. The chilling gunshot heard by the hunting party added another layer of complexity, raising more questions than answers. Sheriff Steve Nolan at the helm of the search voiced his frustration, stating, We looked all over, but there was no sign of him, no clues. The lack of evidence and the absence of any indication of Alvy's presence fueled speculation. Did he fall victim to the elements, or did something more nefarious occur in the heart of the wilderness? Despite the efforts of everyone to find even just a single trace of him, they found nothing. In the vast Australian outback, where the sun painted the land with shades of orange and shadows played hide-and-seek, there unfolded a mysterious tale of a young man named Jeremiah J.O. Rivers. It all began with a pig hunting trip, not your ordinary adventure, but one laced with secrets and shadows. Picture J.O., a 27-year-old indigenous man from the East Kimberley, setting out with a group of seven companions. This journey, starting from Balranald, New South Wales, wasn't just about hunting pigs. There was a hidden agenda, the transport of cannabis to sell in faraway communities. As the convoy rolled through the dusty trails, the air filled with the scent of adventure and the distinct aroma of cannabis. The group, fueled by the drugs they carried, found themselves in a haze of excitement. However, J.O. seemed to be affected more than the others. Hallucinations danced in his eyes, and he spoke of a longing to swim in waters clearer than those around him. The desert, a vast and mysterious canvas, became the setting for a story that went beyond the ordinary. Weepo Creek near Nokundra became the stage where J.O.'s reality faded into shadows. His kinship brother, Joe Cantilla Gaydon, witnessed the unfolding events. In his intoxicated state, J.O. expressed a desire to find clearer waters. As night fell, J.O. wandered off into the unknown, leaving behind a trail of uncertainty. Fear gripped the group preventing them from reaching out to authorities due to harsh conditions and the fear of legal consequences. It wasn't until the next day that the authorities were alerted, delayed by the shadows of legality and fear. The search, a desperate attempt to unravel the mystery, unfolded with land, air, and water efforts. However, the unforgiving landscape held its secrets tightly, revealing no trace of J.O., his clothing, or signs of foul play. The inquest into his disappearance was marked by allegations of confrontation between J.O. and Joe Cantilla-Gaden, adding layers of complexity to an already enigmatic story. 
Days turned into nights and hope dwindled in the vastness of the outback. The family, devastated by the lack of closure, resorted to unconventional means in their quest for answers. International scammers preyed on their vulnerability, falsely claiming a kidnapping for ransom. A psychic medium offered glimpses into the ethereal, but substantive leads remained elusive. As the inquest unfolded in Brisbane, witnesses, including the men from the ill-fated journey and involved police officers, shed light on the mysterious vanishing of J.O. Rivers. The proceedings, a journey into the heart of darkness, aimed to unravel the circumstances surrounding his disappearance. Allegations of cannabis trafficking and violations of COVID-19 restrictions painted a vivid backdrop to a story that transcended the boundaries of a mere hunting trip. The narrative, entwined with elements of mystery, unfolded against the backdrop of an indigenous man's disappearance in the harsh embrace of the Australian outback. Balloons released into the East Kimberley sky marked the anniversaries, a reminder of a void left behind. The outpouring of grief extended beyond the physical boundaries with friends and family pleading for answers that eluded them. The inquest, a beacon of hope for closure, delved into the heartache that resonated through Warman in the wider East Kimberley region. The truth, elusive as ever, remained hidden beneath layers of conflicting accounts and unanswered questions. The five-day inquiry sought justice, not just for J.O. Rivers, but for the community bound by sorrow and uncertainty. Even to this day, the search for J.O. continued, but not even a sign of him has been seen ever since.